Let's pray. Father, we come into your presence thankful. Thankful for this day that you have made, the mercy that is new to us this morning in it. Thankful that you have made this day in particular a day to gather in corporate worship. A day to together lift up voices in praise and to hear your word proclaimed. We are thankful for your word and the fact that it is and that it exists in our language and that it sits in our laps can be heard and perceived by us. Thankful for your spirit whom you send to us to illumine the word, press it into our hearts and change it, change our hearts with it. There's much that we are thankful for and much that we need. So we come thankful and we come asking, Lord, would you in in fact carry out what this day is about, what this word is for, what your spirit means to do? Would you carry it out? Would you gather us here, our hearts here, not just our bodies, gather our hearts here together. Draw out worship from us. Move our hearts to be hearts of worship. And illumine your word to teach us and change us. That's what you mean to do today, and I pray, Lord, that you would do it for me, for each one here, for for others who perhaps hear this later. Lord, would you take your word and would you change us In particular, this morning, Lord, would you open our eyes to your your great power. Power that accomplishes your will of bringing us a king. Lord, open our eyes to it. Cause that to be a sweet thing and not a heavy thing, but a sweet thing. Spirit of God, would you have your way here in this room now And own the words that I say and own each individual mind here as it receives the words. Open us and speak to us and teach us and change us. Spirit of God, if there is sin here in our midst, in individuals or corporately, would you clear it out? Would you make it apparent to us and lead us even now in confession, repentance? Would work now to make level a path that the Savior may come in that the King of glory may draw near. Lord, be our teacher this morning here. Use your word, shape and reshape a people. Exalt your name, build your church. Thank you, Lord. We entrust ourselves to you, even as we pray in your name. Amen. We turn our attention this morning to Luke chapter 1 and the foretelling of the birth of Jesus. While there are significant differences between this passage and many others, there are a lot of similarities with what we find here and other accounts in the Bible about the the birth of important people. In particular, there are similarities between this passage and what we just saw last week, the foretelling of the birth of John the Baptist. After Luke introduced to us his work, his combined work of Luke Acts, and explained it to us as an orderly account of what God has accomplished. That's chapter 1, verse 1. After he introduced it to us, he moved on to talk about how the birth of John the Baptist was announced. A birth that was completely unexpected, hoped for, certainly prayed for for a long time, but by this point, completely unexpected because John's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, were old, beyond childbearing years, and for all of her life, Elizabeth had been barren, childless. As we saw, God moved to answer their prayer and in, and in effect the prayer of all of the people of Israel. Verses 9, 10, 11, and 13 had this repeated note of prayer and the offering up of incense, pray, prayer and praise to God. God moved to answer the prayer of this couple and the prayer of all the people. They're crying out for deliverance, crying out for help, crying out for God to meet them in their need. And he says yes, but perhaps in an unexpected way. The answer is yes, I will act to deliver, I will act to meet your need, and sends John the Baptist first. 
who carries with him a preparatory message about repentance. We talked about this last week. This is an important point from last week. God hears the cry, help, and says, yes, let's talk about sin. John's job, as we saw, is to turn, turn, turn the people, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, to turn them from sin to the Lord, to clear out a path that the Lord can come upon, can enter in upon. That's John's message. We talked about that last week. And our call, the call to us, is to hear that message and to heed it in preparation for the next step in God's plan, the bringing near of, of salvation, the bringing near of deliverance, accomplished in Jesus the Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what comes next. So the birth of Jesus foretold next here in our passage this morning. A very familiar passage to us. I'm going to read it, and I'll just pass back and, and catch a couple of the details, a few things that are important to, to have clear in our minds. And then I'll bring out two observations from this passage, perhaps not the ones that we might think. We read a passage like this, all these passages in the first couple of chapters of Luke are so familiar to us, we, we kind of think we know what they're about. But perhaps they're slightly different in focus. I'm going to make two observations from this passage after I read it and pass through it. So let me read the next move, the next section in Luke's book, in God's work, the announcement of the birth of Jesus, beginning in chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Luke 1, 26 and following. This passage begins similar to how the previous one began, by giving us a, a time and a place and a parent. But rather than focusing on, on two parents who are known as, described as righteous, as followers of God, and then even in particular focusing on the, the man, the father, who is a priest, it gives us instead a young girl, older than 12, but maybe not much older than 12, doesn't say. But she's young. And rather than the attention focusing on, as the text said, Judea and Jerusalem and the temple and the holy place right outside the curtain that divided the holy from the most holy place, right at that, the altar of incense, right there in the center, and then with the announcement in front of all the multitude of people gathered to pray. In other words, all the action happening front and center on a stage. Rather than that, this happens in Nothingsville, Nazareth. It's a backwards, upside-down introduction of a king. And that's what it is. It's the introduction of a king. We have John's parents, who are past childbearing years, and so at a birth they would be unexpected, but Mary's situation, and therefore her pregnancy, is totally different. It's presented as one that is profoundly impossible. Notice the difference here. Improbable pregnancies sometimes happen. 
Pregnancies sometimes overcome age, sometimes overcome birth control, sometimes overcome perceived infertility. Sometimes stuff happens. But what never happens, never happens, is a pregnancy with absolutely zero male input. That's not improbable. That is impossible. That's where Mary is. Verse 27 tells us twice that she was a virgin, using the ordinary word for that state. Nothing special there. She's a virgin. She's a young, unmarried girl. And then after she's told she will conceive and have a son, she asks the angel in verse 34, how will this be? Which is less doubt and more uncertainty. It's less doubt because we see the angel does not chastise her for unbelief as he chastised Zechariah. Her question is, is in a sense saying, I perceive that this will be, but how will this be? Seeing as, since, being that, literally, I don't know a man. Present tense, I'm not sexually active. How will this be? Maybe she's wondering if the angel is talking about right now in, in in which, in which sense, how's that going to happen? Or maybe he means after I get married. Is that how? In that case, that makes more sense, because she is, in fact, betrothed. Verse 27 says she's a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Several important details there. She is betrothed, which means that Joseph's family and her family have already cut a deal. They've already made an arrangement. He's already paid the bride price. He has acquired her. They are legally bound together, betrothed. So much so, it's a legal arrangement, so much so that if you read Matthew's account, when when Matthew records that when Joseph heard about the pregnancy, he wanted to divorce her. Not just break up with her, divorce. The breaking of a legal arrangement. They are a couple. Which means that any child born in that couple is his. Legally so unless he disowns it as being a child of adultery, which he does not do. Any child born in that couple is his, and he's a son of David. He's of the line of David. Any child born here will be of David, which is incredibly important for what happens next. Mary's betrothed. Perhaps she's thinking that she's going to have a baby then. Maybe is that what you're talking about? Maybe that would make more sense, and the angel says eventually here, no, i got something totally other that's going to happen here. But you are going to have a child, you favored one. When he greets her in verse 28, he says, greetings, just hello, O favored one, O graced one. In that verse, and then also in verse 31, the word behind the word favor is the same word behind the word Grace. He's saying to her, you are a graced one. So this is not just, hey, this is your lucky day. He's speaking about God's disposition towards her. God's looking at you. Don't be afraid. She, she's very unsettled. He tells her, don't be afraid. Certainly she's frightened by the angel, but she's, she's unsettled by the saying, it says. She doesn't know what to make of this. But the angel says to her how he approaches her and addresses her. But he says, don't be afraid. You are a person that God is looking at graciously. You are an object of God's grace as he looks at you. Nothing bad is going to happen here. When I say God is with you, you know and I know, the Old Testament, that kind of language means something's afoot. But God's looking at you in a gracious way. What is afoot is good. You're going to have a son. You're going to name him Jesus. And verses 32 and 33 would have made her head spin. Because he reaches back a thousand years to the Davidic covenant and says, Now, the one born to you is going to be a king, but not just any king. He's going to be a king in the line of David the one you've been waiting for. He uses language here. He will be a son of the Most High, verse 32. Similar language down below. He will be called the Son of God in verse 35. That language is actually rather common language 
in the nations of that day. Kings and nations that they used words like that to describe themselves. I am a son of the Most High, not like you all. I'm closer to God than the people. I'm a king who is, who is nearer to God. That, that was common language for saying king. But this is a king in the line of David. He will be a son of God, yes, indeed. He will be a son of David also. This is the king. The one you and the people have been longing for. would have blown her away. This is perhaps the, the change in emphasis. It would have blown her away more than the bit about the virgin birth. We're grabbed by that piece. She would have sat back. Oh my word. The prophecy is coming true in me. I'm bringing the king to you. Which leads me to do a couple of observations. I'm going to make two observations supporting this main point. Here's my main point for this morning. God has acted in power and grace to send to us the king. God has acted in power and grace to send to us the king. First point emphasizes more the power. Here's my first observation. God has the power to do anything necessary to enthrone his promised king. I'll repeat that again. God has the power to do anything necessary to enthrone his promised king. That's where we start. We, we probably tend to read this passage and we, our eyes are drawn to the virgin birth thing. And that is important, and I will talk about that in the next point. But the passage, the, the tension the passage turns around this idea of, of great promise that is impossible, yet happens. That, that's the tension in the passage. There's a great promise here that's going to come along a path, several steps of which seem absolutely impossible, but are not impossible to God. God has the power to do anything necessary to enthrone his king. And I know, I mean, as I wrote that, and, and as I say it now, I know that that kind of comes across as, it can come across as, well, sure, he's God. What are we talking about here? So uh, stating the obvious, yes. Stop and think about this. It, the issue here. God has power. How much power? All the power he needs to do what? To do everything necessary to enthrone his promised king. The great king, the king we need. He's done that. He's doing it. He will do it. Stop and think about this. And first consider the promise which is really good news. As I said, Mary and any original reader would have been blown away by those verses, the couple of verses that reach back all the way to David, to the Davidic covenant. You could read about this in Chronicles, but we encountered it some time back when we preached through Samuel, First and Second Samuel. It arises in Second Samuel chapter 7. Remember the flow of that book? Samuel's the prophet. He has a, a great ministry in his own right, born in a way very similar to John the Baptist. He has a great ministry in his own right, but it becomes apparent that Samuel's main work is to point, to serve as a preparation for, to lead people to the king that God intends to set up over the nation. A desire for a king that initially was wicked. It was wrong for the people to want a king because they wanted a king different from God as king. They say, we do not want this king, we want a king like all the nations have. And God uses Samuel to raise up, to point them to a king that is in fact going to reign over them in the name of the Lord. God says, you do in fact need a king. 
and you do in fact need me as king. So I will raise up over you a king who will bring you back, who will, who will bring you back beneath my rule, into my realm of authority, into my kingdom. That's the kind of king I'm going to raise up. And he uses Samuel to point the people towards that. First Saul, oh, not Saul. Saul looks good on the outside but has no heart for God. And then David. So God leads Samuel to a, a young shepherd boy tending the flock in his father's field. The sweet psalmist of Israel, the mighty warrior after God's own heart. David. The king they need. David, decades pass, he becomes king. He brings the ark of the Lord to Jerusalem, singing and dancing, making a clear and profound statement, I will worship the Lord with all that I am. I don't care if people think about me. I'm going to worship the Lord with all that I am, and I will do everything that I can to place him at the center of this people. I am the king beneath whom this people will experience the right and good, beautiful reign of God. And God then says to him right after that event in chapter 7, I have a promise to make to you, David. I will build you a house. David wanted to build him a house, a temple. No, I'll build you a house. I will build you a line. I will build a Davidic dynasty. And this kingdom, this throne of David, I myself, says the Lord, will protect, will hold, will never turn away from, will not depart from, but there will always be a king in the line of David sitting over my people. I will not take my love away from him, but this throne will last forever. This king will be a son to me, and I will be a father to him, and it will be awesome. The Davidic covenant. And David falls back. Oh, what a blessing. 2 Samuel 7. And what the angel's talking about in Luke 1. A son of the Most High to whom God gives the throne of his father David. He will rule over Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Just like promised. The king that God's people need, the king that the nations need, the king who would bring human beings back beneath the right rule of God, coming. Now there's a lot to say in coming passages about all that that means. I don't want to preach coming passages now. There's a lot to say about that, the beauty of what that means. The emphasis right here, though, right now, is that this king, the one that we need, is coming, though it seems impossible. Just these verses themselves could make a ruler, a reader, like sit back and be shocked and then say, no way, because realize, as, as amazing and, and as hope-filled as that passage was, as I sit here and listen to that, it's been 600 years since a king has sat on David's throne. 600 years is forever ago. 600 years. You can forgive somebody after the first few hundred years of nothing happening if they begin to wonder if it's ever going to happen. Is there ever going to be a Davidic king ever, let alone forever, and by the way, we aren't even the sovereign power anymore. Yeah, we have a king. Back verse 5, we have a king of Judea named Herod, but he's not a sovereign king. He's a junior king beneath the real power, Rome. We're not even a sovereign kingdom anymore, and we don't have a Davidic king in heaven for six centuries. How can this happen? It's not possible. And then the angel says that it actually is possible. And again, lots of things that, to come exploring why that's good. This passage just is emphasizing that it's going to happen, that he's sending his throne, his king to his throne, and doing so powerfully. He's going to do it through a virgin? My goodness, how can a virgin have a baby? Well, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. God in power will bring that about. And in fact, 
Elizabeth, you know, your relative? Yeah, I know her. She's also pregnant, six months now. She, who was called barren. What's he trying to emphasize there? The angel's trying to emphasize something. She knows that Elizabeth doesn't have any children. We know Elizabeth doesn't have any children. But the angel's underlining. She who was called barren. And then the kicker. For nothing will be impossible with God. Not a virgin having a baby. Not a postmenopausal postmenopausal childless woman having a baby. Not the Davidic king coming to throne. Nothing is impossible. I will move heaven and earth to do what I said I would do and put the king on the throne. So, we should stop right there and just give some thought to that. You read the passage, you see the virgin birth, you say, sure, yep, that's impossible. You see Elizabeth's situation, yeah. I can see that the difficulty of having this king come after all this time, yeah. If that's only stuff that happened now a couple thousand years ago, that's good to know, but it it might leave us just kind of wondering, eh, maybe yawning, wondering what the big deal is. God did not do the impossible to put a king on the throne and then leave him there. Leave him several thousand years in the past, having come, set up a kingdom, yeah, that I'm, I don't live in Israel, I'm not Jewish, what's the big deal? This is God grabbing the the hands of the redemptive clock of time, if you will, and moving them and saying, I am changing the times. We now live in the time in which God has accomplished the enthroning of his king. God has set this king, the one that we need, up on the throne and is still about enthroning him. Is still about bringing all of the nations all of the people of God, you, me, back beneath God's authority, back beneath his reign to assert, to exert his rule into us, you. God only was interested in setting up a king to have the king reign. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his rule there will be no end. That includes now. The king is reigning now. And everything, everything, everything that would stand against the kingdom, that would resist the king's rule, is being brought to heel beneath this king by impossibility overcoming power. Impossibility overcoming power. You sit where you sit, and you look at a world. Maybe you look at a world that this. I'm going to work close. I'm going to work towards your heart here, but I'm going to start out there. Maybe you look at a world out there, and you see in the world a host of problems and sin and evil. You read the newspaper and you see travesty and tragedy, all kinds of things that are disheartening and alarming and frightening. The world is by no means submitted to God. And you must set against that, God has the power to do absolutely everything necessary to enthrone his king. God has asserted His determination, I have stated, the king will reign. My kingdom will come. My will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hold the newspaper next to the scripture and know which way it's going. How? I have no idea. Who has any idea 
big picture, out there stuff. How Think of ISIS. Think of worldwide economic problems. Think of global warming. Think of whatever you want that's big and out there. How will God bring all of those troubles, all of those ills, some of them actual sinful wickedness, how will he bring all of that beneath the king? I don't know. It's far beyond me, but it is not far behind him because nothing will be impossible with God. He has determined his kingdom will come. His will will be done. And it's going to happen. Out there, big picture. And I'll move it closer here to you. You've got family members and friends that are frustrating and disappointing. Has God forgotten? Is God gone? Because this one, sure, this, this person who sits next to me, whom I love, whom I care about, this person certainly seems resistant to the Lord's will, certainly seems resistant to the king and his authority. What's going on here? Where's God in this? I don't know. But this I do know. Nothing will be impossible with God. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is the king. He comes to reign. God moved heaven and earth to put him on the throne and will bring everything, as Ephesians 1 says, will bring everything to heal beneath him. including the situations that are much more personal than stuff you read about in the newspaper, including situations that are people that you know, people that you care about, including situations that are you. Perhaps there's something that should be a bit of of a confrontation here or a bit alarming Because it's not just bad stuff out there. It's not just other people that I know that are resistant to him. It's actually often me. You. When we see God saying, I have set up a king and he will reign forever, that means over everything over everyone and over me and over you. If you're not a Christian, I'm going to talk to Christians in a second. If you're not a Christian, you need to consider this. You cannot successfully contend with him. We, we like to play a, a great game here on earth. The I'm sovereign and I'm in charge of me game. It's just a game. It's not true. You're a creature. You were made. You will die and you will answer. Those are the facts. We're not sovereign. We're subjects. And there's a king. God moved heaven and earth to fulfill a thousand year old promise. He's raised him up on a throne, crucified him, raised him from the dead to prove it. He sits in heaven where he is waiting to come to judge the living and the dead. This is the truth. And you are not strong enough to contend against him. That is a sobering reality. He is too strong for you He is too much, and he makes no bargains or compromises. He is a king, not a president. But in that, Christian, there is a word for you too. I spent more time this week thinking about this for me than I did for non-Christians or for other people or for the nations or for ISIS or for whatever. So more time this week thinking about this for me. Because Christians too 
also sometimes attempt to resist or reshape God's intention of exerting his kingly reign over us. More simply, we pick and choose what he's in charge of. That doesn't work either. He's a king. And he will rule over the house of Jacob, over the people of God forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. The whole problem of the book of Judges, to which the king is the answer, is the whole problem of the book of Judges should ring in your ears. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And God said, I will, I will put an end to that for their good. I will put an end to that by bringing a king. He brings a king to us to put an end to our suicidal desire to pick and choose what, he, what, what gets followed of his word and, and what of our wisdom we exert. We cannot split out parts of life that we will allow him to be king over. He is king. We too must bow to him. We too must have the response of Mary, who when she hears all this says, Behold, I am the servant, I am the slave of the Lord. Let it be as you say, I give up. She doesn't have any idea how that's going to work out. That must be a terrifying, puzzling situation when it's over still. But I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be as you say. When we say that God has power, that nothing is impossible, that applies to every realm, of course, but in particular, what this passage is drawing our attention to is that nothing is impossible for God in the sphere of raising up Jesus to reign as king. He has done it, he has accomplished it, and he is accomplishing it. That should give us great hope when we look at things that seem intractable. And it should be a shot across the bow to us, a, a caution, a warning to turn when we attempt to resist. God has power, we don't. Surrender. And do so realizing the grace of God in his resolve to set up this king. Realize the grace of God. That's the second point. Here's the second observation. God has graciously sent Jesus as the unique king we actually need. God has graciously sent Jesus as the unique king we actually need. And I say unique because that's the piece that, through that word unique, it's how I'm going to approach the virgin birth. So it brings us to that piece of this passage. Verse 35 says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. In other words, God in power by the Holy Spirit. Obviously, this is not a physical thing. Spiritually, the power of God is going to exert influence on you, Mary, so that you have a baby. He will create again. And therefore, the child to be born to you will be called holy, the Son of God. He will be called set apart, holy. That's the, the root meaning of the word holy is unique, set apart, distinct from, sanctified in the religious word, different. He will be called holy, set apart, uniquely God's son because of the virgin birth. That's the significance of the statement here in Luke. That's why Luke has it. Luke is clear about the reality of the virgin birth. He teaches it, obviously. But he doesn't present it here for the sake of connecting it to Isaiah chapter 7. Matthew's gospel does that. Matthew talks about the virgin birth, goes back to Isaiah quotes Isaiah's prediction and says, so it was fulfilled. That's Matthew. Luke doesn't go there at all. Luke uses this to point out no human father direct creation by God in her womb. 
And he does that for a different reason. Not to show fulfillment of Scripture, but think about this. Just as it is, the direct creation of a human being by God does not in itself inherently mean that human being is divine. After all, God did that with Adam also. God directly created Adam. Adam's not divine. It does say, though, this person is very unusual. This is different. Totally different, in fact. Something unique here. Particularly when you compare it with the story right before. Yes, there's the unique birth right before of John the Baptist, but that's only improbable, not impossible. This is different. Unlike anything that's ever happened anywhere. He is to be a son of David, but not like the other sons of David, not in the same way. And furthermore, like all other kings, he's to be a son of the Most High, but not quite like all the other kings. There's something different here. God's drawing him aside to himself very uniquely. So he's a son of David, but uniquely so. He's a son of God, but set apart uniquely, differently. We don't get all the details about Christology here, of course. We don't get everything about who is Jesus, and we don't get the fully man and fully God. It isn't here in this passage, but what we do get is here is a king in the line of David named Jesus who is very different. Pay attention to him. The only other situation like remotely like this was the first time that God created Adam. There's a parallel being set up here which we need to pay attention to going forward. Something draws our attention to Jesus in his uniqueness. His uniqueness in origin. Something gracious here. And I pick up that word at first right from the surface because that's how the, the angel greets Mary. Oh, favored one. The Lord has looked on you with favor. As I said, that's, that's the word for grace there. You are an object of grace. God's doing something to bring along this king, to enthrone him, this unique one. He's bringing him to you, to the people, to the world, from a disposition of smile, from grace, not from judgment, not from anger, from wrath, but from grace. I'm sending the king. But there's another grace present, not just in the words, like right on the surface, but there's another grace we should think about. Maybe one's a little less obvious. Mary, you're going to conceive a son. He will be born in the house of David. He will be a son of David. He will sit on the, on the throne. This is the king that I promised. The king that we need. And if you're thinking, perhaps you remember, I use this phrase a lot in preaching through Samuel, he's the king we need, sort of. It's easy, as I did in the first part of the sermon, to remind us of the glory of David. The shepherd, the sweet psalmist, the warrior who, who killed Goliath, the one who brought the ark to the center and, and restored amongst the people a Godward vision. That's, that's the David that we perhaps romanticize and easily remember. But you might, if you keep thinking, you think, oh yeah, the whole last half of 2 Samuel is other. There's that bit about Bathsheba and Uriah. Oh, and there was the rape of his daughter that he did nothing about. And the favoritism towards his son and towards his brutal commander and the civil war that ensued and all the massive bloodshed. Oh yeah, that David. Great. And every son of David after him was little better. 
In fact, none of them were as righteous and as powerful and as holy as David himself was. In fact, the sons of David are what led us into exile, out of the land, in their disobedience. Are we going to get another one of them? Is this actually good news? It is. We don't get everything about who this Jesus, the son of David, is. But we do get this, that he's different. God's moving powerfully in grace to bring us a son of David who is a son of David, but not like David. Better. Who is a son of God, but not like all the other kings. He is uniquely set apart, created by the Spirit of God, possessed by God the Father, sent to us as king. This is a different David. A holy one. What will that be? Well, you got to keep reading. Mary's going to sing about that. Two weeks from now, she's going to sing about some of what that means. But here's a good king, different than David, different than any other man, not like any other human ruler you have known, powerfully set up by God in grace to rule you, that rule, that word rule strike you as hard? It's good. In the hands of this king, the rule of God is sweet. And he is committed to pressing into your life, into the lives of those around you, and into this world. This unique king, graciously committed to it, he is setting him up to reign and to rule. That is good news to us, Christians. That is an offer of good news to you if you're not a Christian. It's a promise that an end is coming in which righteousness and justice falls down on the earth and covers it like the waters cover the sea. And it's a call to us to submit to him, to respond to him like Mary did. I'm your servant, I'm your slave. Let it be as you have spoken. God has acted powerfully and in grace to set up his king to reign over our lives. Bow to him happily. Submit to him and trust him. God in grace is doing that. Let me pray. Lord, would you extend your authority over us? Lord, I think, maybe just me, but I think probably some of us, find ourselves at points often of, of wrestling and resisting where we do not believe that your idea, that your way is best. We resist your reign. Or would you graciously press the authority of Jesus into every nook and cranny of our lives? A king like David, but better than him, is what we need. And so would you make that happen in us? Rule your people, please. Wield great power to overcome our hard hearts. Have your way with us, Lord. Speak to your people even now as they sit for a minute and think. Would you speak to them about perhaps words of assurance as to how you have life under control, perhaps words of conviction or confrontation about ways we resist. Speak to your people. Call them to you. Comfort, encourage, convict, save, reign. Thank you, Lord. Amen.